This week on Empowering Midlife Wellness, I'm talking again about compounded hormones, compounded combination, estradiol, estriol creams, progesterone cream, what's the difference, what's the safest, so many choices. Which one should I use? Hi friends and welcome to this week's episode. If you're just joining me, I'm Dr. Susan. I'm a board certified gynecologist and certified menopause practitioner dedicated 100% to taking care of women in perimenopause, menopause and beyond to feel great now and also to set up the best elderly version of ourselves to prevent chronic disease when we can and feel as good as we can for as long as we can and that starts right now. So today I wanted to talk a little bit more about this controversy about compounded bioidentical hormones because it comes up all the time and we've talked about it a little bit before. So again, to provide some clarity around these words which are not scientific words but they're words that have come up in the community during this 22 year break that we've had from really understanding hormones, a lot of really well-meaning doctors have done their best to fill in those gaps. And so let's look at what's happened there and try to make some sense of it. Well, let's talk again about the word bioidentical or body identical. That applies to any hormone which is chemically identical to what we used to make in our own body. So basically anything that is estradiol, that's the primary hormone that we use for menopausal hormone therapy. The primary hormone that we made from our ovaries all of our lives is bioidentical. So there's another term, synthetic. Synthetic hormones are thought to be bad and natural ones are thought to be good. Well, that's a little bit of a misnomer because estradiol, when we get it from either FDA approved sources or from a compounding pharmacy for that matter, can be made from plant sources like wild yam, or it can be made in a lab, and honestly, it makes no difference. The end point is a chemical which is biologically identical to what you made in your body. It's bioidentical estradiol. So the FDA-approved products like the estradiol patch, the estradiol gel, Divigel, the estradiol spray called Evamist, the estradiol cream called Estrace, there's an estradiol ring that goes in the vagina called Estring. There's a little tablet as well that has goes by a couple of other names. All of those are bioidentical estrogen. And just because they're available from Walgreens, CVS, Rite Aid, does not mean that they're not bioidentical. They, they are. So it's the compound that's bioidentical, not the fact that it comes from a specialty compounding pharmacy. Now, there was this thought, and now it has not been borne out by science, that combinations of estrogens that women make at different times in our lives are somewhat better. Now, there are products that have estradiol, which again is the primary estrogen that we've made all of our lives, along with two other estrogens that females make. Estriol, not estradiol, but estriol, which we make only in significant quantities in pregnancy, so it's not a hormone that we make very much at all, and estrone, which is a much weaker estrogen that has no, I'll just say no beneficial properties, so there would be really no reason any of us would take estrone. Now, in the not so long ago old days, and ongoing in some conversations, there is an idea that estriol was less harmful for breast cancer. Now, now that we know that estradiol actually does not increase the risk of breast cancer death or probably increase the risk of breast cancer at all, that whole conversation is not so important. But you can imagine back not so long ago when estrogen was just dangerous and we shouldn't take it because it caused breast cancer, there was a really good reason to explore some other possibilities. And so estriol got quite popular during those days. And there was a particular product called Biest, bi meaning two estrogens together, which was some combination of estradiol, that's the one we give now, and estriol. It was generally about 80-20, meaning 20% estradiol and 80% estriol. So I used to tell my patients it's about 20% useful and 80% doesn't really work. 
because estriol is such a weak estrogen. We actually use it on our face now in face creams because it is such a weak estrogen. It's all bound locally, so it's awesome for that. But the data on it being somewhat less harmful for breast cancer or whatever other argument was used in those days has not been borne out by science. So using Biest cream, that's the 80-20 mixture of 20%, Generally, I mean, there are different formulations, but generally it was 20% estradiol, which is the important one, and 80% the other stuff, estriol. That's not recommended anymore. So if you're using it, I would say it's not harmful because you are getting some estradiol, but you're probably not getting the most benefit that you could if you just took a straight estradiol product. And there are many studies that have looked at this and yes, it's not harmful, but the standard of care is to use estradiol. And that's what's been used in all of the studies, and it works really well. And there doesn't seem to be any good reason not to do that. So my question would be to a patient who is still using Biest or one of these compounded multi-hormone creams, why they're doing that when you could get a patch or a gel or a spray from Walgreens and it's less expensive and arguably works better and has more studies showing its efficacy. So I am not opposed to compounding pharmacies and I'm going to tell you about that in a moment because sometimes we have to use them. But I think in general, if there's an FDA approved product that works really well and you can get it from Walgreens and your insurance covers it, it's a good question why you would use a compounding pharmacy. Now I use compounding pharmacies and I personally take some compounded medications like estriol face cream. I take a compounded thyroid product because the ones available from regular pharmacy don't have the combination that's right for me. I have some patients who take compounded progesterone because at the regular pharmacy you can only get 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams and for various reasons a different dose might be optimal for them, say 150, so they have to get it from a compounding pharmacy. So really good reasons to use a compounding pharmacy would be if the regular pharmacy doesn't have it, or in a different situation, if the FDA hasn't approved it yet. And so that's what happens when we're talking about testosterone. So this is very curious, and I've talked about it before, but all of the menopause experts, with very few exceptions now, are understanding that testosterone for women is very important and has been shown in numerous studies to help with low libido, which we call HSDD, or hypoactive sexual desire disorder. So if you use testosterone versus placebo, testosterone works better to treat HSDD in patients who have low testosterone. So if we draw your blood and your testosterone's already over 50, yeah, it's unlikely to help. But in most of us who are menopausal, our testosterone's pretty close to zero. And I can tell you as a patient, it helped me dramatically. So yeah, we'd love to get testosterone from Walgreens, but the FDA hasn't approved any testosterone products for women yet, so we're kind of stuck. On one hand, science is saying, yes, testosterone's really helpful for sex drive, as well as having some other very potentially beneficial side effects like improving muscle conservation and bone health. So everybody agrees on that, yet we don't have an FDA-approved product. So we have two choices. We can either use the male FDA products. Men have upwards of 18 or 20 FDA approved testosterone products. So you could go to the pharmacy and get one of those and divide the dose by 10. I've mentioned this before, it's very difficult to do. It sounds like a great idea, but it's highly impractical for lots of reasons. First of all, the pharmacy won't usually fill it because you're female. Your insurance won't pay for it because you're female. And then practically trying to divide a packet of gel into 10 or trying to cut a patch into 10 is incredibly inaccurate, let's just say, and very, very difficult. So even if you could get through the first few hurdles, it's very inaccurate. So in that case, we generally use a compounding pharmacy to make testosterone in the appropriate doses for women because we have no other options. So just to say compounded hormones are not bad, but when we have FDA approved options that have been studied better, are more closely regulated, et cetera, it makes a whole lot of sense to use those, in my opinion. So I would not use compounded, biased, triest, et cetera, creams. 
First of all, creams have all kinds of variability in their absorption, and there are no studies showing that that works better than the alternatives that you can get from a regular pharmacy. And I completely understand, completely understand the skepticism, no judgment, and kind of fear of big pharmaceutical companies and so on that have driven us to think that compounding pharmacies are safer, better, etc. But I think we need to check our facts there and just sort of feel into our heart about why that might be. Ultimately, you can make whatever choice you want to. If you're using biased, it's not harmful if the dose is appropriate. What can be harmful is if you're using progesterone cream. Now, the reason for that is progesterone is not absorbed very well through the skin, and so we don't get adequate levels using progesterone cream to prevent uterine cancer. So one of the big complaints, and I certainly agree with this, regarding using these different compounded creams, is that progesterone is not absorbed well through the skin. So for patients who have a uterus, we really have to take progesterone by mouth or in the form of an intrauterine device or something similar to get enough progesterone to prevent uterine cancer. So that being said, you could use your compounded cream if you really want to, although you could get it much less expensively at Walgreens. And then take progesterone by mouth. We know that 100 milligrams of micronized progesterone is the minimal amount that we need to prevent the increased risk of uterine cancer. But giving it as a cream, we have no idea how much you're going to get. And it's not enough to protect the uterus. So that's an important point. Um, other than that, yeah, we have to use compounded hormones sometimes. And there's nothing wrong with that. So if you're using testosterone, we have no option other than to use a male product, which I've already said is really impossible, if not really difficult, or to use a compounded product. So compounded products we've talked about before, frequently a cream. A testosterone cream is good. I wouldn't say it's great. Uh, the amount that's used in Australia and their government approved product, uh, you know, other countries have approved testosterone for women. So we frequently look at the Australian data. They use a cream that has five or 10 milligrams a day. Now that's a pretty high dose, I'll just tell you. So we generally start our patients on 2.5 milligrams a day and then kind of see where that gets us. I also think we need to give it twice a day because it has a pretty short half-life. It goes up and down a lot during the day. So if we use it twice a day, it makes those up and downs a little more stable. So using a cream twice a day is great. And it's a high maintenance to say the least. And we truly don't know how much we're going to absorb. I, I have used it before and put it on my wrists because that's very thin skin. Some people put it other places, but the time of the day, how close our blood vessels are to the skin, how warm we are, what else we've had on our skin, if we exfoliated, if we work out. There's so many factors that affect how much we absorb. It's not particularly reliable. The other option is compounded testosterone, exactly the same stuff also compounded in the form of a subcutaneous pellet. And it's so curious that many people have very strong opinions one way or the other. It's exactly the same stuff. The question is, are you putting it on top of your skin or underneath the skin? Otherwise, it makes no difference other than when it's underneath the skin, there are a lot fewer factors to worry about. We don't have to worry about the skin barrier, the temperature, all of those things. Now, there is still some obviously some differences in absorption, even when it's placed under the skin. But in my experience and the experience of our patients, much fewer. So we do see a more stable testosterone level with a pellet than with a cream. And does it matter? Probably not. I think either one are just fine. But I just invite you to check your feelings if you have very strong feelings one way or the other. So when I meet someone who's like, oh, testosterone cream is great and pellets are terrible. Yeah doesn't make a lot of sense. It, the, these are just emotions that are not really bound in any type of realistic scientific evidence. <laughs> of course, there's an argument that if you have testosterone under your skin, it's going to be there for three months and you could have all kinds of side effects. Well, back to what I've said many times before, 
the dose is the poison. The testosterone's not the problem, it's the dosing that's the problem. So you need to get it dosed appropriately by a provider that knows what they're doing. And I would recommend making sure you get no more than one to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram of your body weight if you get a pellet. And if someone's offering you more than that, I would request that they dial it down because ultimately we wanna end up with testosterone levels in the physiologic range for women. Arguably that's sort of 50 to 70, maybe 50 to 100 at the most, but not really higher than that. So that's where we get the benefit. Studies have shown it without running into side effects. So I hope that helps and doesn't further confuse the conversation about compounding bioidentical synthetic. Just to review, bioidentical means the product is biologically identical to what we used to produce in our body. So that would be either estradiol, progesterone, no other names, or testosterone. And whether it comes from a plant source or whether it's manufactured from scratch in the lab doesn't make any difference. It doesn't. It might sound better. It might sound better for marketing, but it's the same product once your body sees it, does not know the difference. The other estrogens, estriol, estrone, probably not useful and totally understand why they became popular because we were so scared of breast cancer, but now that's starting to fade. The standard is to use estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone. And at the current moment, we have no choice with testosterone other than to get a compounded product unless you wanna try getting a male product and cutting it into 10 and good luck with that because I have not been able to be successful in that myself. So compounding's not bad, but hey, if you can get something from Walgreens and CVS that's paid by your insurance and is more tightly regulated, why not do that? Doesn't mean you can't get testosterone in pellet form if it's dosed the right way. And last thing I have to say about that is if you're getting a testosterone pellet and you're postmenopausal, many people just put the estradiol in there too. Not because the patch is bad, just because it's easier. So there's a lot of strong opinions about this stuff, but we're truly just trying to be safe, easy, something that you can be consistent with, get relatively stable levels and stick with long-term. So if you can do that with a cream, a patch, a spray, a pellet, whatever it is, I don't much mind what it is. We just need to find something that's consistent with your lifestyle. And do not use progesterone cream if you have a uterus. It's not enough to protect you from uterine cancer. That's what I have to say about that. So I hope you learned something today. If you did, please share it with your friends and I can't wait to see you next week. Mm -hmm.